David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, and uh, we here are airlifting everyone out of the show today as we abandon the framework uh, that we've been using to put the show together for the past 20 years. No, not exactly true, but it's not a bad idea. It would be nice uh, to take off again. Ah, I remember vacation like it was uh, a couple of days ago, because it was. Uh, Still not entirely with my feet properly beneath me, but that's okay, as we have help, as we do many mornings. Uh, Well, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays from Greg Dworkin. Today being a Wednesday, that means we're up for yet more assistance. But this assistance has to be cut off at some point. We have to stand on our own two feet and bootstrap something, something, something. I just had to say that so that Republicans didn't get angry and, I don't know, go to their local school boards and protest that anybody who listens to the podcast ought not to be allowed in a public school, something like that. I guess that could happen at any moment. So, all right. Very good. Uh, We begin today. Ah, here's uh, Bill's morning tweet. Uh, Another one of these items of getting ready in the morning that I'm, oh yes, I remember now. I'm supposed to be looking for and reading the morning tweet. The k in the Morning Radio Show is live now. That's good. Let's do that part. By the way, belated happy 10th, oh, look at this, broadcast anniversary to k X. That's me, David Waldman. Hi, I'm the host of the show who began his radio legacy, if that's what it is, on August 13th. Is that right? 2011. Yikes. We were still in Afghanistan back then. Yes, that's true. And I guess had been for 10... 13, 12 years at that point. I don't know. Uh, That's pretty crazy. But yeah, look at that. Is this our, uh, what are we on? The 10th anniversary broadcast anniversary. Oh boy. All right. Well, good good enough time to quit. See you later. Goodbye. No, we'll continue on. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. We'll uh, explore the rest of the agenda for the day. Greg Dworkin already lining up the important stories in his view. And so uh, we can head over to to that raft, those stories, in just a few minutes. I don't know. What's happening this morning? Still people battling over the Afghanistan story. The Republicans, I mean, predictably enough, seem bound and determined to blame the whole thing, the 20 years of involvement in Afghanistan, on Joe Biden, who's been president for 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Well, I'm curious to see how well it works. And that's kind of been one of the major themes. Both, uh, I think both Greg and Joan hit on that possibility. Just the the reality that most people probably are uh, certainly fatigued with the Afghanistan war. And uh, there's some significant question about whether or not Republicans will be able to lay blame for any part of it, whether it's simply the manner in which the withdrawal was handled or the entirety of the war at Joe Biden's feet or on uh, at the feet of Democrats in general. Uh, even the uh, criticism that sometimes comes from some in the Democratic circle about the way the withdrawal was handled is simply it just makes no sense to me. It's as if they don't remember the extraordinary efforts that Donald Trump made to lock in place a formula for disaster. I mean, I think people are sort of waking up to or being reminded of the fact that, oh, yeah, and I do remember that now that you tweet me that headline again. There was that weird period during which everyone was criticizing Donald Trump for Uh, attempting to have a secret meeting with the Taliban, sort of out of left field at that time, a secret meeting with the Taliban, and of course that he was having a secret meeting with the Taliban at Camp David, which is sort of synonymous with the, ever since the Carter days, the uh, negotiation of peace deals, uh, at least Middle East peace deals, and Afghanistan not exactly Middle East, but Central Asia, and for a lot of people... Uh, a lot of uh, similarities and conjures up a lot of memories and for him to bring them there on or close to the anniversary of 9-11. Also, apparently a symbolism lost on the dotard Donald Trump. 
And uh, yeah, uh, now people are sort of remembering, oh uh, yeah, why did he want to, br he didn't ever came to pass, but what was he up to then anyway? And then of course, the big flurry of activity post-election, once Trump realized he wasn't going to be president anymore, um, and no one's entirely sure of his reasoning for this, but he very much wanted to make it, uh, I, at, at that time, he wanted to make it part of his legacy, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But I guess because he never actually plans and executes anything, it didn't occur to him that it wouldn't be something he'd be able to complete in the interim between mid-November and mid January while he was still president. And uh, so he simply made demands of people in the military uh, and in his, uh, I guess, his civilian connections to the military, simply made the demands that uh, that it should be done. And when they delivered him the bad news that it's not quite that easy, we're not going to be able to finish this thing up before the transition to the Biden administration, at which point, I guess, Trump began thinking, well, what can I do to make sure that there is no transition to the Biden administration? But in the meantime, uh, basically, the order was given, do as much as you can do. Make it irreversible, basically, is what he wanted to do. Burn down all the bridges, as is usually the case with Republican strategies on anything and everything. Make it impossible for people who hold different opinions or want to take a different approach to try their different approach by destroying all possibilities other than the one I opt for. And he did that and he bragged about it in speeches and people continue to circulate the video of him insisting that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was A, his doing and B, a juggernaut that he had started and put in place that would be impossible for the Biden administration to stop. Then when it came to pass that it was, in fact, impossible for the Biden administration to stop it, even if they had wanted to stop it, which they probably didn't, because it's 20 years is enough already, uh, I, it, it then shifted as though it were the plan, and I'm not certain that it was, because I'm not certain that Trump plans anything, but as though it were the plan simply to uh, blame Biden for the outcome of a terrible, not quite plan, put in place, possibly... <laughs> <laughs> if anything's ever put in place by the Trump administration. How this is being missed at Axios, Politico, uh, Meet the Press, gee whiz, I have no idea, except for it must be the same factor at work for the past 30 years in all of those outlets, except for Axios and Politico, which are relatively new. But those people were working elsewhere and learned the craft in uh, people who are in on the big joke at uh, outlets that were in on the big joke long before they founded their own outlets to perpetuate the big joke. All right, Greg Dworkin is here to help round up the rest of the day's news. Uh, I'm out of here, I think. Bye. That's the new the new approach to things. I, it was set in but motion it's not a bad approach. yesterday's show, and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, right. Read the news yourself. That's what you're doing anyway. Okay. Right. Well, we'll talk about well, it. Well, you What's know, up, it's, uh, that's because uh, there's been a basic collapse of our uh, – news media abilities uh, since, I don't know, 2015, 2014, something yeah, like that. Earlier, and sure. what happens is that all we get is cheerleading and dumb stuff. Well, yeah, they do what they know, I guess. I guess. You know, it's all access journalism. Where did they learn it? I don't know. I, that is, you know uh, access Axios journalism. And, yeah, and, you're right. Uh, and Politico. They, they learned it at Politico. It's funny. that Axios And then all the Politico people, uh, after, you know, right? either left or started their own companies like Axios or farmed out to the New York yeah. Times, uh, you know, and, and uh, it's the same sort of crap. I guess that's true. And now that, that really kind of sparks something for me, just a realization. Like, what did we think we were going to get from a, a news organization called Axios? Probably access journalism. They, they seem to have named themselves after the practice without being explicit about it. I mean, they didn't so, name yeah, they, it. They, they call themselves what they are. And, and you know, Mike Allen, what, do you, what else yeah, do you need to know? Right. Uh, other than Chris Eliza, who oh, has yes. faded into obscurity. Uh, well, good. The nice That's thing nice. about Eliza is as the salary goes up, his visibility goes down. Well, you know, it might be an even trade. I, you know, I resent that he's paid as much as he is, but if I think if, it's a more than it even trade, the less I see of him, the better. Yeah, I mean, it might be a good deal, like you know, paying people, uh, paying farmers not to grow crops. You know, if they're well, you know, and then we have our old friend Chuck Todd, and it just might work. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and uh, well, you know, Biden withdraws from Afghanistan, and it just might work. 
Uh, yeah, uh, so the, here's the day. At, uh, Tom Friedman wrote an interesting piece. Really? Uh, you know, it wasn't a Friedman unit in this case. Uh, he simply tried to make the point that, uh, you know, the months. day of coverage doesn't matter. And even the day after coverage doesn't matter. It's the day after the day after. You know, it sounds like Rumsfeld, <laughs> okay. which is good because I mean, Rumsfeld is the one that started Union. this mess. But yeah. let me give you a headline from The Washington Post. Taliban moves toward forming government as evacuations proceed calmly. Okay. Now, you wouldn't know that because people like Richard Engel on MSNBC and the cables are the worst have footage of chaos on the first day. Oh. So what they do is they say, well, wow. things are much yeah. calmer today. And then they show the footage of the first day <laughs> over and over yeah. and over. Here it is. And calmer. even as things calm down, they keep showing footage of the first day. That's why the optics matters. People say, why mm. do you keep going on optics? Because this is why. And yet. <laughs> Again, I, I don't know uh, who said it. I can't remember anymore. I think we talked about it on Monday even, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but 90% okay. of the public wants us out, and 90% of the media doesn't because, mm, yes, you know, right. they love covering yeah, uh, foreign intervention. It was... That and deficits. Yeah. I mean, those are the two big things that they can't be neutral about, someone said. Huh. Well, that is interesting. No one notices, by the way, after three days of the same footage, like that guy seems to be running laps around Kabul. Yeah, you do <laughs> notice. You, you turn off cable. So uh, Margaret Sullivan noticed another headline in the Washington Post. The Afghan debacle, 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 last debacle. two decades. The media spent two hours deciding who to blame. Oh, well, at least it was two. Yeah, two decades, a big breaking story demanded the news media provide historical context and carefully avoid partisan blame. It's the story of the fall <laughs> of Afghanistan to the Taliban. Instead, what we largely got over the past few days was the all too familiar winners and losers. Its coverage tends to elevate and amplify punditry over news and to assign long lasting political ramifications to a developing situation. Huh. And that's the thing that, that I think is more annoying than anything else. I get that they ignore the fact that we stayed when we should have left in Afghanistan, except for the time that we left when we should have stayed, which was Tora Bora. And the fact that Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld et al. not getting out uh, and making Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden the, the uh, central part of this. And Obama had the chance to do that after killing bin Laden, too, and didn't. Hmm. Uh, so, so that's part of the deal there. But to just focus on the last couple of days as the entire history of America's involvement in Afghanistan is just flat out ridiculous. Yeah, the whole story is so. One guy so I think uh, Margaret Sullivan is onto something there, and okay. and talks about uh, the the failings. Uh, Larry Sabato has the media will never admit it, but they've been waiting for an opportunity to harshly go after Biden to prove anew how balanced they are. See, it's not just Trump. Uh, I guess I don't. Really... Uh, there's a little bit of that. I mean, there's there's certainly criticism to be had about the uh, chaos of the withdrawal but you know some of it is just ill-founded for example uh one of the things that people are criticizing is the fact that the uh, mm -hmm. uh sivs they're called the uh SIVs. the emergency visas oh okay it is such a problem because it's so bureaucratically ridiculous well today the uh biden administration is announcing new rules about how afghans get Visas, fine, okay, in sure. response to pressure? Well, it's been in the work since May. Okay. Uh, now, which I guess governments you a take, for, we, we talked about this in terms of uh, CDC and, and uh, flu response and, and uh, COVID response. Uh, governments are not nimble, and they're hidebound, and they have their own rules. I just look at Congress, for example, where you're an expert, and you just can't get stuff done quickly you're when you need expert. it to get done quickly. And yet the process has been going on since May. And what happened is that when they were taking their own sweet time, which they considered to be lightning speed, uh, the Taliban yes. uh, take over and the Afghan government collapses. And so now they're left with what well, we didn't finish. So mm -hmm. they finish in a couple of days. Is it hurried? Yeah. But is it because the Biden administration didn't foresee that this was going to be a problem? No, because they started it in May. In May. OK. Yeah. You know, uh, so how do you cover that? Uh, well, look at these pictures from two days ago. <laughs> That's the answer. I mean, you you just covered it, and it was pretty quick. But you know, but if you don't have five seconds, how about this picture from two days ago? 
right? So, you know, wow. and it's cable, so you have to have pictures. Mm. No, so uh, what then happens is that, okay, things are calming down and people are getting out. It's not great. I can't believe there's uh, chaos and, in and Biden still has plenty of blame, you know, in terms of, of how chaotic it was and the fact that, that we were ill-prepared. And there's plenty of blame in the Biden administration for lots of things, including COVID, which we'll get to, because CDC's messages continue to be completely muddled. And ultimately, as he said in his speech, the buck stops here, which is great so that you have an American president actually being honest with the Mm. public and the public is going to be okay with it, even though the media is not. Contrast from I don't I don't take responsibility at all. Exactly right. Complete contrast. In Esquire, Charlie Pierce writes, the anonymous sources are engaged in a monumental ass covering campaign on Afghanistan. (laughs) Almost everything you're reading on this topic in elite publications is an effort by somebody somewhere to duck out of their responsibility for 20 years of fantasy and illusion and outright lies. That pretty much sums it up. I think so. Right. Craig Whitlock of The Washington Post called all of them out when he printed the so-called Afghanistan papers. Anything that is attributed to the various anonymous sources that in any way contradicted by Whitlock's work is simply not to be trusted. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's pretty absolute, but all right. Yeah. But, you know, it's true. So uh, why don't we ask John Bolton his opinion of the uh, (laughs) withdrawal? He's got one, I'm sure. NPR did on Monday. Yeah, right. Reminded us of that. Uh, you know, know. and so, uh, Jennifer Rubin has column today, a primer on false narratives about Afghanistan. There's many alarmist headlines pronouncing with certitude what has occurred or will occur in Afghanistan. Many are premature or out of date. Others ignore information now available to us that debunks fanciful explanations for the Afghan military's disintegration. Fortunately, both the defense department through spokesman, John Kirby and Hank Taylor, the deputy director for regional operations, And the White House, through National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, by the way, who gave a very good briefing in addition to Biden's very good speech, answered dozens of questions on Tuesday. We also have the benefit of the detailed Inspector General's report on the Afghan conflict, whether one believes the Biden administration or not. And that's in quotes. The question certainly reveals some of the misconceptions that plague analysis based on fast changing events. For example, we abandoned the Afghans. We failed to get people out, which is false. The airport in Kabul is up and running. Flights to evacuate U.S. citizens, third-party nationals, interpreters, and other Afghan partners. The military predicted within 24 hours we'd be flying out five to 9,000 people a day. Hmm. You didn't get that impression on Monday. The administration has been in communication with Taliban commanders to allow people safe passage. The Taliban have promised that they will. I'm not saying that, oh, the Taliban says so, so it's true. But the point is that, well, they're not doing anything. Well, actually, they're doing something. something. Oh, so you should report that. Now, you can uh, evaluate whether it works or not. Fine. Mm-hmm. Chaos failure, says uh, uh, Jen Rubin. As Sullivan said, no 20-year war will end on a dime smoothly. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki acknowledged there have been chaotic moments, but the evacuation's underway. Pronouncing failure based on the first 24 hours of a complex operation is premature. If the administration restores an orderly process... The initial conclusion of TV watchers will prove false, especially if they keep watching Richard Engel replay that first day over and over and over. Mm. And I think we talked about on Monday, part of the problem with people like Engel is that they have people there who they know and want to get out. So, you know, it totally emotional response and they're not doing like hard news on it. Huh. And yet the reporters who you always remind us were in the Capitol on January 6th, they don't run footage of january 6 over and over and say things are still in chaos no they don't you know and if there was ever a both sides situation it's Uh afghanistan and they don't do it yeah uh hmm why is that why is that the administration didn't anticipate a taliban takeover not an immediate one which is false the possibility was in intelligence reports biden talked about it he didn't expect it in 24 hours he expected it in a couple of weeks and that changes of course how you respond there that was a mistake, should be criticized, uh, because he should have seen that it was going to happen faster. Uh, but, you know, when, when the Pentagon's lying to you about what's going on, you get fooled. I guess that's that's true. Dang. Okay. All right. Uh, we should have moved people out earlier, which is true. But yes. had it begun to evacuate thousands of a few weeks ago, panic could well have descended. Then, you know, true. this is one of those moving also. targets. It doesn't matter when you do it. It's not going to be smooth. Yeah, as I was saying, I can't believe something didn't go smoothly in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, But the worst part of it are those who are claiming, well, if we only kept the status quo, things would have been fine. It was not fine. 
Hmm. Yes. Well, right. If uh, the situation point. was deteriorating, it has been for a year. So uh, that's where that stands. Uh, Sam Perry, uh, who uh, measures a lot of uh, uh, polling academically uh, for the religious communities, has an interesting uh, poll uh, this morning in a tweet thinking on the crisis in Afghanistan. Who's less likely to favor accepting refugees? Story involves religion and race. White evangelicals are the most anti-refugee. Oh, yes. Right. Unless they're Christians, while black Protestants and atheists are least likely to hold anti-refugee prejudice. And that's important because Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram are already railing about the whole thing is set up. Biden withdrew so that we yes, could take right. these millions of uh, dirty, diseased uh, Afghans into the country. And there's no way we should do that. They're trying to replace us. Mm, yeah. The 20 year plan was always about that. Uh, the Something last like that. couple of days. Uh, big plan to get Afghans into the country. It is really kind of amazing uh, and, and, and predictable. And it was predicted. I did see people. In fact, I think Matt Gertz at uh, um, Media at Matters, Matters uh, predicted a couple of hours before Ingram and Carlson did it, I guess, before they went on the air. He said, I, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, here's what they're going to do today. And in fact, he was exactly right. No surprise. You know, they are racist xenophobes and. Uh, they were true to form on this. And, and by the way, there's the answer now. Uh, finally, the answer to the question that prior to this, people like Tucker Carlson, and I, I mean, I think Tucker Carlson actually did once pose this question, and Ingram and others, the, the old, uh, back in the o o olden days of the war on terror, where are all the moderate Muslims who will step up and condemn this terrorist activity and the answer is you're keeping them outside the gates at kabul airport refusing them entry that's where they are yeah pretty much this is the people uh, this is from the uh, pundit roundup this morning and just a, a smorgasbord of headlines here hmm. david rothkopf from the daily beast biden's right that it's time for us to leave afghanistan garrett hake from nbc news critical context for everything we're watching in afghanistan from the washington post about the afghanistan papers on Afghan military, the U.S. built, quote, U.S. military trainers described the Afghan security forces as incompetent, unmotivated, and rife with deserters. They also accused Afghan commanders of pocketing salaries paid by U.S. taxpayers for tens of thousands of ghost soldiers. Yes, I did see Matthew something Matthew Iglesias, the, uh, the president. In writing in Slow bor Boring, uh, his uh, uh, Substack blog, Biden and Trump did the right thing on Afghanistan. The war was lost long ago, if it were ever winnable. Josh Marshall takes the same approach. Uh, it's just interesting because, uh, you know, they are of the 2003 Iraq war blogger era, as are we. Uh, right. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, people keep saying, well, it's like Saigon. Actually, it's like uh, the Iraq war where the media just jumps up. Ho, ho. We got access. You give us access to a Humvee and one of your generals and we'll tell you how great the war is going. Hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, to see that from them, same people, uh, you know, now is okay that's not at all in the least bit surprising i guess not you know and if anything instead of uh trying to uh analogize this with saigon and vietnam completely different war and situation uh to me it felt a whole lot more like uh, <laughs> obamacare and the uh, computers crashing the first day mm. Well, that tells you oh, how the whole oh, system's yes. going to work over 10 years. No, actually, it didn't. You know, that's 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 a good point. It actually, that reminds me of something I saw Armando reacting to today, which was him re actually reacting to Josh Marshall reacting to an Axios story that Ax the most facile, stupid thing I've ever seen, really. Honestly, the Taliban, apparently they're reporting, blew up a statue of a Shiite military leader who had fought against the Taliban during Afghanistan civil war in the 1990s. And I guess somebody put up a statue and they blew it up. And I mean, really the dumbest possible thing. They actually went there and did that. They, they compared it to the blowing up of the 1500 year old Buddha statues back in 2001, which, you know, aggravated everybody and, and uh, scandalized the world uh, against the Taliban. And, you know, that was in their why it matters section of the story actually yeah. saying, you know, well, I don't know, a thing blew up and another thing blew up. So it's the same thing blowing up. They're both statues and, it, and they're both deeply meaningful statues. This 15 year old statue to a Shiite military leader. Uh, yeah. Uh, Josh and Armando immediately both like I just astounded that you would put that not only in your story at all, but in the why but, but it matters. Think it's wise and think it's an example of how yeah. savvy you are. 
Yeah, I remember another thing got blown up in Afghanistan. You know, we've been blowing things up in Afghanistan for 20 years. People have been blowing right. things up before that for 100. So I don't know. Why those two events? Because I have footage of them. Ah, that's the difference. Okay, that's what it is that makes it similar to you have stock footage of both of them. Right. Therefore, the end. Right. All right. You know, and Richard Engel could use that blowing up the Buddha statue in all of his reports and say, look at the that's chaos. That's right. It's still blowing up Buddha statues. They didn't know there were so many. So Mike Mazar writing on Twitter, uh, talking about Brett Stevens and other critics of the uh, withdrawal. One argument of critics, as Brett Stevens claims, the U.S. had a cozy, minimal presence, which any American president could have maintained almost indefinitely. In other words, we had achieved good enough solution, uh, but that's far too simplistic, dangerous and misleading. Many least. problems with this vision of a permanent minimal war. Number one, there's no end to the effort. Number two, even with a small force or economic cost, like $14 billion in 2021. Uh, number three, the stay forever plan assumes the Taliban would have tolerated such a stalemate forever. They would not. And number four, indeed, the best guess is probably there was never a stalemate to preserve. Mapping Taliban control is tough, but lots of indicators show gradual rise in power. Essentially, what they did is ever since that Doha meeting with Trump on uh, supposed to take place on 9-11, but they managed uh, uh, Camp David managed to meet and make a deal anyway. Mm -hmm. where the Taliban were supposed to take over May, May 1st, the Taliban had been paying commanders to, like, go away. Yeah. So that way you don't have to fight them, and so they could just march into the capital, uh, you know, and take over. And that's what they did, and it worked. Well, congratulations to them on good planning. Somebody had a plan that worked and was executed brilliantly in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just leave this Afghans with Molly John fast. If you're one of the architects of the Endless War, perhaps you should sit this one out for analysis. <laughs> yes, uh, endlessly, as a matter of fact. Why don't you just occupy that position endlessly from now until forever? Try that, Brett Stevens. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and We Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegor in the Morning Show here on Net Roots Radio. We've been on here for 10 years, apparently, the whole time, which is what? Uh, why we sound so tired. <laughs> well, 10 years? Yes, apparently it's our, t or, we, or we just recently had on August 13th, while I was still away. Uh, uh, Bill keeps track of these things and says this is our, our 10 year anniversary. You're kidding. No, I, he, he may be kidding, but I'm not kidding. I'm merely reporting what was said. You well, know well given works. the amount of time I let you talk, you've only been on five years. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I've just gone back in time. It's like a time machine. And, uh, Something like that. Okay. Well, I could have been napping for five years. Uh, you know, at least uh, having nice uh, breakfast. Right. So... Uh, it, Let's talk about uh, something other than Afghanistan. That'll work no. itself out. Basically, Biden's going to be judged, as Tom Friedman says, not on, you know, that day, but not on the day after, but the know. day after the day after. So we have to how see how things roll out him. over the next week or so, because that's really going to set the narrative. All right. Because a lot of this stuff was just nonsense. And thankfully, not that many people watch cable news anyway. Right. Good. So other Fair news. Enough. Uh, let's talk politics a little bit, and then we'll get back to the pandemic, which Do is also any? politics. But okay. uh, what I have in mind here is a different Axios story. 
have what? a couple of Axios things oh, that aren't yes. their savvy view of how to interpret everything in terms of a Richard Engel video. Mm -hmm. This is Axios reporting that House Democrats introduced voting rights bill named for John Lewis. Yes, I thought we already did that. Uh, so the bill would restore elements of the Voting Rights Act. Why it matters. Democrats are trying to counter a wave of new voting restrictions. And, uh, you know, the House is poised to vote on the measure next week. OK, uh, according to this. Uh, so why is that important? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. You'd think, well, you know, it'll die in the Senate and all that. Well, no, 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 no. There's a bigger picture here. All right. And of course, here's where we need some of your expertise. So uh, as we uh, covered in detail. Yeah. And as everybody knows, the Senate passed the BFD Act, which is a bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill. Yes. And they've yet to work on the uh, reconciliation bill. Right. The House has to deal with the fact that the Senate passed this BFD bill. Yes. So the moderates want to pass it right away. Mm -hmm. The progressives say, hold on, we need reconciliation and we need to make sure everybody's on board with that. And the reason we went along with the BFD is because the things that we couldn't get in the BFD, we expect to do in reconciliation. So you have to vote in tandem because it's a package deal, right? which Biden has said and which the moderates have said and which the progressives have said and which Manchin has said and which Cinema has said and everybody has said. So we all mm -hmm. get that part. And then uh, Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey says, wait a minute, we're moderates and I've got eight of my colleagues here. And we are sending a letter to Pelosi, who has oh, wow. only a, right. a three, four, you know, member majority. We're sending uh, a threat to her that unless you pass the PFD You're thing arrest. first, we're not voting for anything. Mm. Yes. And Pelosi looks at them and says, you're kidding. OK. There's and a they, lot more moderate not... votes than there are. Uh, uh, a margin, but there's way more progressive votes than there are moderate votes on this. True. And it was part of the deal. And Biden wants it, too. And Gottheimer says, well, you know, we want power, we moderates. We want to be treated like the progressives. So we're going to get together and try to hold this thing up. And Pelosi says it's not going to work. And Gottheimer says, no, it will. And Pelosi says it's not going to work. It's not how I run my caucus. OK, so here's uh, the stalemate. And uh, Politico reports this morning, Gottheimer offers an open hand. I'm sure we can work this out, Gottheimer oh, told us Tuesday night. That's nice. That, that means Pelosi has the advantage. Good. And here's where your expertise comes in and try to explain this. I don't know. Pelosi and Biden constructed sort of a compromise. They want to pass a rule which mm -hmm. includes both pieces, the BFD and the reconciliation. Okay. And then... The moderates get to vote for the uh, BFD first, just like they want. Could be uh -huh. five minutes before the other one, but they get to vote that first. And then the reconciliation second. And okay. so that way they have an off ramp for these demands that they've made on the speaker that they are not going to get. Mm, yes. And it's not clear whether they're going to take that off ramp. And that's why it was interesting that Gottheimer offers an open hand. Thus begins the potential end game for what is shaping up to be a decisive moment for the Biden agenda next week, says Politico. Gottheimer and eight other Democrat moderates, Democratic moderates, they say, are vowing to oppose a key vote on the budget if Democrats don't agree on a standalone vote on the bipartisan bill. No waiting around for weeks or months until the multi-trillion dollar reconciliation package is ready to go. Pelosi has met that threat with barely disguised disdain. In an attempt to box them in, Pelosi put forward a rule... Whenever I see rule here, I think it should be capitalized. You've taught me how important the rules mm. are relative to uh, preceding the actual vote, which says the terms of debate for legislation in the House that includes the budget, the infrastructure bill and a voting rights bill that all nine moderates have co-sponsored. Uh -huh. That's why that John Lewis thing is so important. There we go. OK, it's your bill <laughs> and right. it's going to be in this thing and you're going to vote down the bill that you co-sponsored. We'll see. That's your off ramp. You can say, yeah. well, I wanted this, but, you know, you have my bill in it. So I felt like I had to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The tactic is having an impact. We're told that opinions among the nine are divided on whether to oppose the rule. So already the nine have split. OK. 
Pelosi's no dummy. She's played this game before. Yeah. Some want to vote against it in a show of force, while others see no reason to do so as long as they hang together on the subsequent vote on the budget itself. That is to say, you know, retreat, mm-hmm. <laughs> set up a new line somewhere else. The White House went public Tuesday in support of Pelosi's move, and she highlighted the endorsement in a letter to colleagues explaining why they need to pass the budget resolution immediately. Mm -hmm. So she said to them, "Okay, I get your point about this needs to be done immediately. What will be done immediately is the rule. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, you get what you want, and then we'll talk about it later. Okay. So, Hmm. says Politico, it seems likely the Monday rule vote, because it's coming up this Monday, is safe for Pelosi, though not a sure thing. The next hurdle will be the budget vote itself. And that brings us back to Gottheimer's offer to negotiate. Hmm. So far, Biden and Pelosi don't seem eager to get the New Jersey congressman and his colleagues in a room to work out a deal. But if they do, what could they offer? Uh, the size of the reconciliation bill is reduced from $3.5 trillion, And then House progressives will bail on the infrastructure bill. Hmm. So the moderates want to take away the leverage progressives wield by waiting for an infrastructure vote. And progressives want to keep their leverage. Yeah. So what can Pelosi provide the moderates? Well, salt relief. Okay, right. I know they're after that. There's New Jersey. Remember New Jersey? Yes. They come from a high tax uh, state and local tax state. Yeah. Or does she smack away Gottheimer's outstretched ham and dare him and the moderates to scuttle the Biden agenda? And that's what we're going to find out. Mm-hmm. And there's the interesting part. In other words, Pelosi holds all the cards. She wins either way. It's a question of how does she want to win? Mm, And so as many people have pointed out, including uh, Josh Hudak from Brookings and others, that when you have a 35 seat majority, a group of 10 or 15 people uh, or 20 can actually hold up things. Yes. But when you have a three seat majority, paradoxically, the speaker's in a way stronger position Mm. because nobody could really afford to do what she doesn't want because nothing gets done and they know it. Yeah. That's uh that's a uh, yeah I mean uh, it's not always necessarily So, so your case, job is but, to explain what I just said and make sense out of it. Oh well, hmm, I don't know if I can make sense out of all of it, but uh I, I mean I, and I think the rule part makes sense to most people by now. I guess what we've seen uh, uh and oh that's a good point about whether or not we capitalize it. I think the capitalization of the rules by the way. Uh usually the, in the conventions I've seen when they're talking about a rule with a capital R they're talking about a standing rule of the house one that says you know you're not allowed to punch each other on the house floor whereas the lowercase rule uh lowercase r rules are the procedural rules just that apply to one bill at a time and control uh, how debate will be handled. Which is what we're talking about. Here. Yes. So that's what we're talking about now. And uh, long time, you know, listeners to the show, readers of Daily Coast, et cetera, will have seen several other examples of how much you can do with those rules, including uh, deeming other bills to have been passed in the adoption. Uh-huh, of the, the famous demon pass. Right. So <clears throat> one of the things you can do, uh, we also, you may remember this from the passage of the Affordable Care Act, when it was the position of the Senate that the underlying uh, Affordable Care Act had to be passed stand in, you know, in standalone form uh, and be signed into law before any reconciliation procedures could be used for the sidecar fix that the House was demanding. And there was a fight at the time between the House and the Senate, both democratically controlled, uh, over whether or not the House could insist on the passage of the fix in reconciliation first and only then agree to uh, pass the Affordable Care Act, which on its own was at the time deemed insufficient. But the Senate insisted that that couldn't be done. Uh, it really could have been done, but uh, you know, there were we were under the thrall of a Senate budget committee chair who insisted, I know the rules of reconciliation and you don't. Everybody has to listen to me. Kent Conrad, who said uh, it's impossible to pass the reconciliation fix first because it's fixing a bill that doesn't exist yet, but that's actually quite possible. And they do it all the time and especially easy to do in the House where you can just say, tell you what, why don't you write into the rule that that's okay? And if we get a majority vote for that, that'll do the trick. So here, Pelosi has a couple of options available to her, including a rule for the consideration of the standalone infrastructure deal bill that says uh, upon passage in the House, 
you can do things like uh, have the clerk hold the bill. It's now passed in the House, but it hasn't been enrolled in the House, that is, or engrossed, I guess, uh, and prepared uh, for signature by first the Speaker, who then passes it on as an official uh, passed bill, an adopted bill, to the president to sign. They can hold it for a while, and the president can't sign it if he doesn't have it. This, here's all the importance of the physical possession of the papers, which we've discussed before as well. The president can't sign the bill, and the 10-day clock on signing it or not signing it or vetoing it, not vetoing it, doesn't start until he gets it. You can't count the 10 days if he doesn't have it in hand. And uh, they can they can do just that and say, well, look, you moderates said you had to pass the standalone infrastructure deal and it had to be done first. You've now done that. Now, it can't become law until we send it to the president, but it can become law later if we send it to the president later. My plan is, why don't I just put it in my pocket until the reconciliation bill is either, depending on how the deal is worked out, either uh put in motion or, in fact, passed and adopted and ready to send to the president for signature, at which time I will then, under the rule we adopted here, first send the now enrolled, engrossed, signed and ready to go, but still in my pocket infrastructure deal, which I'll send first out of courtesy to you because you wanted it signed into law first. The right. president will sign it, and at which point we will deliver him the reconciliation bill. On so the same Pelosi day, has all but, the tools yeah. to do this. And, you know, he and she who, you know, have the gavel make the rules. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's just interesting to see it play out. I'm not really that worried about it. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. Uh, no, I, I sort of think Pelosi be. knows what she's doing here. Yeah, it'll anger. Some, there will be some number of the nine. Be, but again, there, there will only be nine feathers. Yeah. I mean, and some of them will actually five. be steamrolled and right. they can't do anything about it. Right. And uh, when they say, I don't like this rule, this shouldn't be the case, this is manipulative, I don't, I, I think it's uh, it, it, whatever, somehow dishonest. Oh my God, a revolt. Did it pass? Yeah. Yes, it did. Right. Well, then, you, yeah, right. You stack it up with things and say, well, okay, five out of the four of you say this sucks and you won't go along with it, which is why I'm also throwing in, you know, uh, or reminding you that salt relief, say, would be in the reconciliation bill. Something by the else, way, some so other sweet. This rule in there also too. includes that uh, very important uh, uh, voting rights bill that you all co-sponsored. Right. right. Yes. So the, basically, the idea is okay. If you to you know whatever it is, save face or look like a tough guy, would say, I'll sink the budget because I feel like I'm getting rolled by Pelosi by the order in which bills are being presented or the day on which bills are being presented, then you also have to go home and say, I also voted against the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, which I Which I will let people know that you did, by the way. Yes. And I don't mean, think I won't. I will go right. to your district and remind people that you voted against the John Lewis Act. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you want it to go that way, Oh, and by the you way, can. you know, listen, you have, you have an alternative, way. just like, uh, you know, our good friends in the in the Senate, uh, uh, Senator Manchin did. You mm -hmm. can go get 20 ah, Republican right. votes to line up with you. Go ahead. That's true, too. Come uh, back and talk to me when you do. That's another one of their problems, right, is that they think, well, this is a bipartisan infrastructure deal. So if we put it in a standalone and we provide our nine votes uh, the Republicans will come along and provide the other 200 and something of them. But I, I, I don't them. think they will. They won't. I mean, it is a bipartisan deal, but do you think that they wouldn't want to sink it? Of course they would. Of course they would. You know, so again, uh, Pelosi knows what and she's doing. She knows fine. her caucus and she's in a pretty good position. So that's that's that. Yeah. So I wanted to get that in there uh, right. along with a couple of other uh, small pieces. Uh, uh before spending maybe another uh, 10 minutes talking about the pandemic and the fact that Greg Abbott has COVID and the fact that Ron DeSantis is pushing a Regeneron treatment of antibodies, uh, uh, which is, uh, by the way, uh, pushed out by one of his number one uh, uh, contributors. Hmm. Yes. But, you know, uh, the, the, the other small things that At include stuff like, for example, uh, the... Uh, draft of the Arizona uh, fraudster report is supposed to get to the Arizona Senate on Monday. So, you know, it's going to be a very interesting yeah, week of politics for a quiet that. summer. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah, we missed out on the latest developments. Out it's just, I mean, 
what can I tell you? It got crazier than crazy. So yeah, uh, and I saw another I story that uh, passed by real quick that there's uh, some arrests and a uh, a uh, a sex ring scandal that came out of Sturgis. Oh really? Oh yeah. okay. Well, why wouldn't there be a sex ring? But why wouldn't there be? Right. Because you know projection. Sure. Although, I mean, I don't know that bikers ever fooled anybody into thinking that they weren't involved in but, sex you know, rings, the, but... the big news, of course, is is not just the the Afghanistan stuff, but the pandemic. Now, just uh, for the record, the uh, right Business that. Insider points out that governors of all 50 states are vaccinated against COVID-19. OK, well, that's good. But right. a lot of them are. Uh, that includes ones you like. That includes ones you don't. That includes Christy Noem. That includes Ron DeSantis. That includes Greg Abbott. Yes. In fact, Abbott says he's had three shots somehow. Right. Uh, not that it mattered very much because he also has COVID. Uh, he says he's asymptomatic, but is getting Regeneron treatment. Yay. Now, the uh, monoclonal antibody is given in two situations. One, if you have really mild symptoms, but you are at risk. Uh, and okay. because of uh, uh, Greg Abbott's is, uh, spinal right? cord injury yeah. and other things that we don't know because we don't know his medical records, he might be at high risk. Sure. Uh, he's uh, 63, but, you know, he has uh, medical issues. Yes. So in that sense, you know, he probably qualifies. And there's also a codicil in the emergency use authorization that says that uh, for high risk people, even without symptoms, you could use it as prophylaxis after you've been exposed. Oh, all right. So that might be also how and why he's getting it. So I don't begrudge the fact that he's getting this Regeneron treatment. And again, Regeneron is the name of the company, not the antibody. Uh, but uh, yes. people call it that, the Regeneron treatment. Because the name is... Uh, because it's easier to say than the actual name of the drug. Right. Uh, however, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the idea that a, uh, a, a rich guy who uh, uh -huh. is trying to hold up the rest of his state in terms of uh, uh, taking COVID seriously and blocking uh, home rule mandates about masks right. should somehow be able to get this relatively expensive treatment immediately – Mm -hmm. where other people don't, uh, certainly is, is bothering folks. And by the way, uh, there's a new poll out in Texas that says that 72% uh, of Texans uh, oppose uh, uh, Greg Abbott's stand about uh, mass mandates locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, he's not in so a it's good not position. So it's not popular across the country. Axios, again, has a Even Ipsos poll. Most Americans favor mandates. A percentage of adults supporting mandatory masking in school. Democrats, 92. Independents, 67. Republicans, 44. Overall, 69. And that's 72 in, in Texas. So uh, the Republican base, of course, is uh, on the other side of it. But you know what? They're not the majority. And uh, just as the uh, news media gets it wrong in Afghanistan, they get it wrong by keep covering these. Uh, let's go to a diner in West Virginia and see how they feel about, uh, you know, mass mandates. It's the rest of the country that matters. And yes. uh, most people, and a serious most people, not 51%, or uh, I got one vote and so it's bipartisan, mm. but most people 70%. really are, you know, sort of uh, had it with this approach. Yes. They want mass mandates. They're sending their kids to school. Uh, school uh, closures are rising, just as the Delta cases are uh, about to peak, I think, mm -hmm. maybe. Oh. Uh, but, uh, you know, you go to school and then you start spreading it. And so it's not so clear what happens after that. And it turns out that, uh, because of all of that, uh, you know, Biden is taking a look at the, uh, through the CDC of what happens to your antibodies over time after you've gotten your vaccines and they do appear to drop off a little bit. It's unclear how much. Uh, data in Israel says enough so that people should get a third shot. And so in Israel, they are giving a third shot. Mm. And Biden, as early as today, may announce that that's what we're going to do here. Some of the oh. experts are looking at that and saying, not so fast. You don't really necessarily need it. And the idea mm. that you should uh, start giving third shots when some people haven't even gotten their first shots is kind of crazy. But once you politicize that, you don't really have any other choice. You know, there may be no other way to go. The problem is that the uh, muddled messaging from CDC and the government doesn't really help set up for that. Remember, just two weeks ago, it was a uh, pandemic of the unvaccinated, which I right. hated because it stigmatizes the unvaccinated. But as it turns out, uh, it's worse because it's not true. If oh. you can have breakthrough, oh, right. even yes. mild uh, symptoms, 
uh, with a vaccination after you get exposed and then get infected, then it's not just a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Well, that's just wrong. You know, and, and again, let's let's just uh, go through quickly in uh, simple terms what this vaccine does. This is an airborne disease. You have it. You sneeze on me. It gets in my nose and mouth. If I'm not vaccinated, it goes further into my lungs. I get really sick. But if I get the vaccine, you sneeze on me. The virus still gets into my nose and mouth, but not into my lungs because the vaccine has protected me. So I don't get sick. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's great. Now, sure. in the alpha variant, it didn't even get into my nose and mouth that much. But with the delta variant, it does. I can still spread to other people. And so the vaccine doesn't stop me from being infectious. It just stops me from being diseased. It's great. It keeps me out of the hospital. And that's what the government's been focusing on. But because it could still spread, yes. the vaccine doesn't make you virus proof. And therefore, it isn't just a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And so that line of reasoning is dropped. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to turn to, okay, well, you know, they're not going to say, well, we were wrong about that any more than they're going to say, well, we were wrong about our advice early on about masking. They'll say the situation mm, has evolved, are, okay. which is true. Delta is yeah. different, which is true. And so now you're going to wind up needing, uh, you know, shots. Yes. And, a mask. and the people who got the first two will get the third. And it's not clear what the people who never got the first one are going to do. Uh, yeah. Nor is it clear of what happens to people who only got one because they got the Johnson and Johnson. Well, well, that's coming. They I'm actually have hopeful. promising data yes. on that. Good. And preliminary data suggests just, that if you got the Johnson and Johnson and then follow it with an mRNA vaccine yeah. like a Pfizer or Moderna, you actually have the best protection of everybody. Good. Let's go get that. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's coming. I don't that's like evolving. That and again, when you muddle your message, you don't really set up for what happens next. Right. And so trying to win the moment uh, is always bad. Mm. It's not just the uh, journalist who, well, you know, who won the cycle? Who won the news cycle in the last 24 hours or in the last yeah. eight? But the government can't look at that as well. It's a terrible way to look at it. You have to set everything up long term and have an idea of what you're doing. And so whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's uh, COVID, you know, here's your plan. Tell us the plan. And if it's a good plan, stick to the plan and explain the plan. And if it's not a good plan, say it wasn't a good plan and we're changing it and here's why. And so that kind of transparency, uh, we understand why that's missing from foreign policy, because like you can't tell the truth. Uh, yes, and strange. Right. Way. My foreign policy so. analog in this other country is a complete dipshit that doesn't understand anything, but I still have to work with him. You can't do that. <laughs> yes. You know. So there's always going to be a little of what we like to call diplomatic language. We had a frank discussion. Right. Right. That's the word. We had a frank discussion. Oh, my sure. God. They were screaming at each other, throwing right. things. Uh, so Exchange I understand that part about it. But when it comes to uh, domestic and COVID and CDC, uh, be transparent and tell the truth. It's just still true. Hmm. All right. Well, that's good advice. Uh, anybody listening? We'll see. We'll see. This is yeah. like Thatcher writing in Stat News. I spent last week in a COVID-19 ICU in Louisiana where health workers' re resilience have given way to a new frustration. The young dying patients they're scrambling to treat are the same patients whose decisions are prolonging the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yes. They called it extremely frustrating, a soul drain. Many are reaching a breaking point, not because the pandemic has lasted 18 months, because today's deaths, even compared to last year's, are so mind-numbingly needless. And that's why Ron DeSantis running around Florida is saying, I know our... Uh, health system is collapsing, but why don't you take this Regeneron stuff? Yeah. That's our way out. Well, no. Local mass yeah, mandates right. allowing people to do the things they need to do, which is what they do in northeastern states in California and the, the Pacific Northwest uh, yes. and uh, Midwestern states, anybody but your state. Uh, you know, why don't you just admit that what you did was wrong and you're killing people? Well, I understand why you don't want to admit that, given that that's the case, but, you know, change course. Tell people uh, you had a revelation. Yeah, right. Uh, at, at, at the minimum, I mean, you should have learned that lesson. So uh, as something to disarm critics who have shown their hand and how they'll deal with these things. The anti-maskers uh, who now say, well, you changed your mind on masks. And that is a narrative that's like taken hold and convinced people to listen to anti-maskers as opposed to it could have been taken away. Yeah, we changed our view on masks because the situation changed, and here's why, and there's an explanation for it. Not everyone will get it, but, but they never really made that effort. Right. 
That is so uh, here's a piece in the Washington Post. Rise of Delta variant mm-hmm. and waning immunity are fueling breakthrough infections, experts say. We could have done a much better job at setting realistic expectations for the vaccine, said Paul Ofit, a pediatrician and vaccine expert at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, CHOP. And I think that hurt us because I think people get disappointed. They think the vaccine isn't working. And this reframing of what success looks like is a daunting messaging task for public health officials who have repeatedly described the coronavirus in alarming terms. They're now emphasizing protection against severe disease and death rather than blanket protection against Mm -hmm. infection. Nobody knows how many breakthrough cases there are, partly because, by the way, the CDC stopped measuring. Uh, nor yeah. are there degree of severity. And part of the reason they stopped measuring, and we talked about on Monday, it's because state health departments have collapsed and they can't do their job. And so the CDC has no way to measure. Yeah, they were dependent on people actually caring and doing it correctly. Right. So Washington Post, the what States. the country's left with is a series of muddled messages from federal health officials and confusing research studies about breakthrough infections. A nation's 169 million fully vaccinated people are forced to navigate the summer surge of cases fueled by the Delta variant with limited information about protection against the virus and durability of their immunity. And, you know, again, from the very beginning, the feds should have said, we don't know everything about the virus and Delta's changing things. Here's what we do know. We don't know this. Here's what we do know. Well, why don't we know this? Because it's new. We don't know this yet. Oh, if it's new, I'm afraid of everything. Well, you don't need to be because this part is what we do know. Mm -hmm. And the fact that 169 million people yeah, have been right. vaccinated and are doing just fine means it's safe. That we do know. That should tell you something. Uh, and also, the people who don't get vaccinated are doing uh, much worse than the people who are. And we do know that. Well, what we don't know are the total number of people who are getting uh, infections because a third of the uh, vaccinated who get infected are asymptomatic. Mm-hmm. And so it's really hard to know. Not everybody's getting tested. So if that's the case, then here's our best advice, which will change as we get more information. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying stuff like that. No. And in some cases, I think they did say that and it just that's not what people wanted to hear or what they didn't. uh, Somebody they thought they heard or they lied about what they heard. But right. And so before the the break, just get in this piece. Um, Yes. Very clever. Texas school boards are uh, uh, getting past the mask mandate ban by saying, oh, it's just part of our dress code. Ah, yes. Well, that was a good idea from the start. I saw a lot of like uh, the non-experts on Twitter came up with that one. Great one. All right, Greg, we'll wrap it up. See you tomorrow. Welcome back now to the KU on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ten years later. Okay, yes. Uh, one thing I wanted to put in on, uh, on the record in response to what Greg was telling us, uh, particularly just roll back a few minutes ago to Ron DeSantis and his plan, if it is a plan, to push the Regeneron thing. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a million other things that he could have pushed and still been equally Trumpy. Like, it is interesting. I saw people cracking jokes on Twitter about it. Why not push hydroxychloroquine? Why not push, you know, uh, whatever else it was, zinc, eating zinc supplements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, But uh, people then pointing to the fact that apparently a big investor in Regeneron, one of... uh, DeSantis' biggest donors, that's always true. That sort of thing is always worth looking at. Uh, But beyond all of that, and beyond the speculation of whether or not he's doing it as a favor to a major backer or not, and it could be, it could just be coincidence, or it's coincidence that plays out very well for them, or whatever. At the very least, he's not pushing something that's been proven not to work. So, I mean... That's good. So he's chosen wisely for himself not to push something that has been pretty much demonstrated to be a hoax through and through, but at least it's Regeneron. Uh, But even though it works, uh, Mark Sumner was pointing out on Twitter last night, I guess he's been thinking about it and running through numbers saying DeSantis pushing the Regeneron rather than vaccine. That is to say he's not anti-vax on the record but he's anti anything that would help get people vaccinated. So he's in effect anti-vax, even though he himself is vaccinated. But uh, even if he were to push this as hard as he could and to make some serious and concerted effort, and he says he is, uh, I think we mentioned on 
Monday, maybe, that he had uh, deployed what he was calling, what, mobile rapid response teams to bring Regeneron out to people who could benefit from it. But there's some question about, A, who could benefit from it, and B, some question about why his door-to-door uh, uh, intervention is somehow less tyrannical than the proposed door-to-door intervention from the Biden administration, which was just to knock on your door and ask, do you want a vaccine? Because if you do, we have it. Come get it. Not as Republicans portrayed it and other lunatics portrayed it, a door-to-door effort to kick your door in and vaccinate you against your will. And no one who was knocking on the doors had any vaccine on them, I don't think, and uh, wasn't uh, going to be the one to administer it anyway. But somehow, Ron DeSantis' plan to have a mobile, rapid, door-to-door response team that actually, I guess, has Regeneron. And remember also that administering Regeneron is apparently four shots, at least two of which have to go in your stomach. So somehow, that was like less tyrannical because Ron DeSantis, Republican, proposed it. That's why it was deemed less tyrannical. But anyway, even if it were to go forward the way he announced... Mark pointed out all uh, of the infusion sites with Regeneron that are in Florida now. Uh, By the way, there are a grand total of three uh, sites in Florida capable of administering the Regeneron treatment to people. Even if they were all working 24-7 and administering Regeneron to everyone that they could in that time, they would only be able to treat about 4% of COVID patients in the state. In addition to which, treating all cases, I I guess if they were able to treat all the other 96% of them as well, would cost the $400 million per day in order to do that. And on top of which, it would end up saving fewer lives than if they had all just been vaccinated in the first place. So, you know... That might have been a better solution, and they can't go back in time and vaccinate everybody, but, I mean, if you're going to have a mobile response unit, uh, well, one, I don't know what's mobile about three infusion sites, but, uh, I don't know, four, three, four, five uh, of them isn't going to make much difference, and and none of them appear to be mobile, but if you're going to, you know, if you're going to intervene and go mobile with rapid response, why not carry some vaccine on you, too? All right. Let's see. Uh, Right, Mighty OCD commenting about the mobile response teams and the door knocking. Don't forget that they were also going to steal your Bibles when they held you down and vaccinated you. True, they were also going to take your guns and force you to uh, into a same-sex marriage. And what else were they going to force on us? In the they were going to kill your grandparents, I guess. By the way, that's a pretty interesting uh, uh, follow-up on that. Remember that. Ten years ago, since I guess it's our 10-year anniversary, or very nearly our 10-year anniversary in broadcasting, that means that, uh, well, probably, I guess it was still lingering around 10 years ago, although maybe more like 11, 12 years ago when they were working on passage of the Affordable Care Act, although I think they continued to lie about the Affordable Care Act even after it was passed. Uh, But remember that uh, 10 years ago, the charge from Republicans was that Democrats were going to insist that your grandparents and the elderly among us not get treatment and be killed instead. Uh, Now, uh, as it turns out, the reality is that they're driving around trying to give them vaccines to make sure that they don't die. So the elderly end up being the most protected from the pandemic. And, you know, a lot of that happened under the Trump administration. And we tried to allow him to grab credit for creating the vaccine and then therefore promote it to others and to tell them that they ought to get vaccinated. But he refused to do it. So, okay, fine. We'll just scoop up the credit for ourselves, I guess. If no, you're just going to leave it lying around here and unused. We'll take it. We don't want to see it go to waste. But yeah, 10 years ago, the Republican charge was that Democrats are going to come around and kill your grandparents. Uh, 10 years later, it turns out that the reality is that Democrats are going to go around and save your grandparents' lives. So the new story from Republicans is that that's tyrannical. It was going to be tyrannical 10 years ago when they killed your parents. Obviously, it's tyranny to run around killing people, right? Uh, 
but then they didn't do it and they actually did the opposite. They ran around saving their lives. That too is tyranny and maybe even worse because I don't know reasons. Today is the, this is happening now, so it must be worse than what happened before, which is obviously less bad for uh, reasons unknown to everyone. But just sort of pointing that one out. All right. You know, thought that was somewhat interesting. Uh, let's see. Other uh, info waiting to be revealed in pocket today. As I did, I mentioned, we got brief mention for the fact that Greg Abbott has tested positive for COVID. He likely, you know, I imagine he won't die from it because there was this early intervention. I know I meant to mention that uh, when when Greg said that there were, what, two, uh, I don't remember how he put it, but two uh, 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 parts of the protocol for administration of Regeneron and one was, you know, having, uh, you had to be at a certain point in your illness or maybe you had underlying conditions that put you at greater risk and it's possible, entirely possible that Greg Abbott has got those. I imagine it's it's more than just possible. It's very likely given what we do know about his health status. Um, uh, but uh, there's a third reason to bypass everything and give you Regeneron and that is if you are friends with Donald Trump. Or at least that used to be the case when he was president. Um, now it doesn't explain it quite so much. But back then, uh, whether you had symptoms or not, whether you had in fact tested positive or not, or whatever, uh, if you were a friend of Donald Trump, Regeneron was on its way to you. And so the administration of Regeneron to Greg Abbott seems like a continuation of that same corrupt policy it isn't because trump isn't president anymore but it, it has that feel so like if i were writing for axios i'd be able to get away with writing why it matters because trump is secretly you know funneling regeneron to his allies even though he hasn't been president for how long has it been six months ten months i don't even remember anymore january to now all right now is the eighth month so eight months uh less seven months okay Anyway, uh, there's more than that, of course, going on with Greg Abbott, uh, one, testing positive, and two, getting the Regeneron, and Hunter covers that over at Daily Coast, uh, and did so yesterday evening, and I, the, the real nugget of it is here in the headline, because Hunter makes it easy for us all the time with those headlines, uh, the story follows up on a Texas governor, Greg Abbott tests positive for COVID-19 one day after maskless Republican fundraiser. Ah, now it's not scandalous in the least that he had a fundraiser, except maybe that's all he does and he doesn't actually govern Texas, but uh, having it maskless to make a point, you know, we don't care about such things, seems pretty ridiculous. I don't think that he would have tested positive as a result of having contracted it as his own maskless fundraiser but perhaps more likely than that was that if he was positive the day after the fundraiser it's very likely that he was positive the day of the fundraiser as well and he was not wearing a mask and spreading it to everybody that he came in contact with and of course at a fundraiser for greg abbott who is the one person almost everybody in attendance is more or less guaranteed to have had contact with or to have sought contact with? The answer there would be the infected guy, Greg Abbott. So some number of uh, later deaths among the people who would be the types likely to attend a maskless fundraiser for Greg Abbott. I don't think that a lot of them were doing a great deal to prevent themselves from getting seriously ill with the disease beforehand. So there's going to be some deaths among the group, possibly, that are Greg Abbott's responsibility. But never mind all of that, because something, something, and hey, gosh, look at his hair, let's make him president. Uh, well, Hunter covers it this way. In a statement, the office of Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced this evening, yesterday evening, that Abbott has tested positive for COVID-19. Abbott, who was previously vaccinated, is said to be currently experiencing no symptoms, but is allegedly receiving Regeneron's monoclonal antibody treatment, an expensive treatment that is in such short supply that doctors approve the treatments only for those most likely to develop severe COVID-19 symptoms. May very well be him. The statement does not indicate 
a potential source of Abbott's COVID-19 infection, noting only that he is tested daily. Uh, Okay, so, and he first tested positive, quote, today. Last night, Abbott, this would have been Monday night, was not wearing a mask uh, in attendance at a crowded indoor Republican fundraising meeting. So maybe it wasn't a fundraiser for Abbott himself. Maybe, maybe he didn't greet as many people as he might otherwise at one of his own fundraisers. But even so, at a Texas Republican fundraiser, the Republican governor of Texas likely to have seen a lot of people shaking a lot of hands, spoken to a lot of spit in a lot of people's faces, etc. But they do claim he's tested daily. And if we believe them about that and the results, he was perhaps negative when he went to the fundraiser, positive the day after. I guess with the Delta variant, it might be possible to be, you know, to, to, catch it and manifest it that quickly to contract it at a fundraiser on Monday night and show up positive on from it on Tuesday. But I don't know. I'm not up to speed on exactly the way the Delta variant works. Uh, my understanding was that it would take a few days at a minimum. So again, it was likely that he was infected, but not yet had not yet tested positive maybe at the fundraiser or, you know, Hey, Maybe nothing happened at all. Maybe he didn't. He wasn't infected when he went to the fundraiser, but going about maskless, certainly just generally unwise in all situations, no matter what your test results are that day or the next. Uh, And the reason is because you can't always tell exactly what your status is and exactly what the status of everyone around you is. And if you put a barrier between you and that person on your face and they put a barrier between you and them on their face then there's two barriers for these stupid germs to get through and sometimes it will and sometimes it won't but for the times that it won't you're better off you should do that well anyway let's uh roll on here there's uh an embedded tweet from Texans for Abbott containing a photo of Greg Abbott at this very crowded indoor fundraiser, the Republican Club at Heritage Ranch, wherever that is, meeting tonight. And, uh, you know, Heritage Ranch sounds like the sort of place where maybe a whole lot of elderly people live, and there are a whole lot of elderly people in this photo as well. They probably all feel, well, I'm vaccinated because elderly people got it early when there was still a lot of cheering for the vaccine. So maybe they think they're all protected. And Greg Abbott himself was vaccinated, and he probably thought so too, and it turned out the next day that he was wrong. The Regeneron drug has been pitched by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as an alternative to vaccination, which it isn't. A bizarre move that may or may not have been influenced by the financial investments of his top donor, uh, Hunter says in a linked comment here. And you can read that story elsewhere. Uh, also over at Daily Coast, as Texas Governor Abbott has gone th- to great lengths to prevent state government entities from requiring vaccines or masks, even as the state faces a massive new pandemic surge and resulting shortage of hospital beds, risking the lives of countless Texas residents. There is no exception that Abbott's own infection or the expectation of Abbott's own infection will cause him to rethink those policies. No one ever thinks that that's going to be the case. Uh, speaking of stupid governors and people who should be held to account and people about whom history will wonder why they were not hanged alongside, like literally alongside Donald Trump in a four or five person gallows, like we set up after the, uh, Surratt trial and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, just saying it is possible. We know how to do it. Uh, let's see, Arizona governor, uh, Doug Ducey showed up in my, Uh, Twitter feed this morning with the news that he was, uh, again, looking, like many governors, looking to, Republican governors, looking to interfere in the ability of local schools to do what they feel would be safest for their students. That is to say, impose a mask mandate. And his play was very much like, Uh, those in other states, uh, you know, using the power of state government in order to make it more difficult for state uh, for uh, local governments and school boards to do what they thought was the right thing. 
The Hill reporting Arizona governor withholding grants to schools with mask mandates. Uh, we can read a little bit of the story to get the background of it here. But it, it just sort of occurred to me that, well, one, you should be, you know, adding him to the list of people who need to be dragged out of their executive mansions and held to account one day for what they're doing to people, especially the children, let's say. And two, um, that uh, he is, after all, using the Trump playbook here and Ukrainianizing the Arizona school systems. He's basically calling up and, look, I need you to do me a political favor here. Don't have a mask mandate. If you do, I will threaten your funding. I will withhold grants that you are due, that are that the state is obligated to give to you, that we've already awarded you, but I'm going to interfere in the paperwork if you have a mask mandate. Uh, the sort of corruption for which we ordinarily would... Uh, quite, you know, uh, without much hesitation, impeach a chief executive, whether the president or a governor, but now normalized under the Donald Trump administration as a legitimate function of the executive branch to interfere in the award or the administration of already awarded grants, something that, you know, for all the time I spent in government, it was fairly obvious that it was part of the you know the governing consensus in America that wasn't done. Yes, it was something you could do. And yes, it was something that you might even think you had the power to do and so therefore must be a legitimate power. But it was always something that you had to couch in very careful terms. If it was really uncovered by the news media before, in the olden times, that you had, in fact, interfered in the grants process and the grants administration process for political reasons, and these are political reasons, then that was called out as a huge scandal and people would call upon you to resign. You wouldn't resign, but you would be called upon to resign. If you were a Democrat, you might resign, but Republicans never would. But it was always like, well, you have to wink, wink, nudge, nudge about these things and say, well, it wasn't that I was saying I would withhold grant funds. It was that I was saying that something, something, something. You'd have to come up with some sort of technical explanation. But now Republicans feel comfortable post-Trump in just blurting it out, saying the quiet part out loud. And here it is. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey on Tuesday announced that the state would refuse to provide federal COVID-19 relief funds, which they, I don't, I don't know whether they can or can't do, to public school districts that have mask mandates in place. Uh, this probably in response, by the way, to word from the Department of Education that the first ploy of Republican governors, and I think maybe first deployed in Florida, uh, was that, was that uh, the state would withhold state grants or state funding, or they would slash state funding to schools and school systems that put a mask mandate in place. And the Department of Education announced, by the way, the federal grant program that grants money to states to grant to schools to uh, make up for costs incurred in dealing with the pandemic can be used to make up any shortfall that might come from a vindictive governor trying to withhold state money from you. So Doug Ducey says, well, I can trump that. I'll withhold, I'll block the progress of federal money through my state government to the school systems that they were thinking of using to make up for the fact that I was already slashing their budget at the state level because of the mask mandate. So he's going to block federal funds. I'm not entirely clear that he's going to be allowed to do that in the courts or not. I'm not sure. But uh, once again, playing strongman, but this time with someone else's money. And I think that's pretty enormous uh, and, and again something that would have been a resignable or impeachable scandal prior to trump but is now openly done he announced that he would refuse to provide federal covid19 relief funds to public school districts that have mask mandates in place and p.s one other you know political and procedural note for you uh 
if you were ever on the fence or still somehow on the fence or still somehow thought, well, I'm a moderate guy and I want to reach bipartisan compromise with my friends across the aisle. And we all feel that the schools need aid in these times. And I feel we should be making that aid, uh, granting that aid directly. My friends on the other side of the aisle for various ideological reasons believe, on the other hand, that the, the states should administer those grants, that it should be made. Uh, in the form of block grants to the states. Does that ring a bell for you? Make block grants to the states. It's so much more efficient. The states know better than the federal government how to spend that money in Arizona. Send the money to the states. It's so much more efficient. What does it now enable the stupid states to do? It enables stupid, rogue, moron, murderer governors to say, well, I control the state block grant and I am not going to administer it properly. I'm going to block administration and distribution of these grant funds to schools on an individual basis based on my disagreement with them over, in this case, masking policy. Whereas in the olden days, the federal government would say, no, there's nothing you can do to stop it. We are, the Department of Education has made this grant to this school system to do this thing. But in the name of efficiency and bipartisan compromise, we've ended up block granting the stupid things and sending it to state governors who can then, you know, tie things up and gum up the works and lose the paperwork and end up blocking those federal grants. Thanks, block granters. That wasn't necessarily the initial theory. There, are, You know, one of the big Republican theories behind block granting uh, actually, or at least I, I guess I should say the Democratic theory behind what the Republican theory was. The Republicans never said for sure whether this was their theory. But the idea of block granting, uh, Democrats worried that by block granting these funds or turning them into block grants to the states, that they would be easier to cut across the board because one, it was a bigger pot of money and two, it was more abstract. Uh, instead of sending, well, okay, theoretically, I'll just throw out some words. Instead of sending ten million dollars to Arizona, what if we saved money and sent nine million? And it's just more. It, it seemed like it was less worrisome or impactful. Yes, it was a cut, but you say to the local, you know, the state government, well, you're only getting nine million, but you know how to spend that money better than the federal government. You can spend it more efficiently, and in fact, you might even be able to get the same impact out of nine million dollars that the federal government would have been able to get out of 10 million. But in addition, it was uh, more, it was, it was simpler to cut because when the government, federal government was making those grants directly, you could have said things like, well, if that grant is cut, then the Phoenix school system loses $25,000 for its blah, blah, blah project. And people say, oh, that's really bad news. We depend on that project. I feel that cut happening. Whereas if it happens at the state level, the $10 million turns into $9 million. You can't say for sure how much Phoenix is going to lose out on for its, you know, marching band program or its school lunch program or whatever the program is. And it just becomes harder to identify and therefore easier to cut. But now we know that a secondary effect of all of this is that it allows at least uh, in the first instance, governors to threaten to block the administration of those grants. Whether they eventually lose in court or not, we have yet to find out. Normally, I would say they would lose. These days in federal courts, I don't know whether I can guarantee that anymore. But uh, in the meantime, the school systems suffer, uh, especially if they have to spend money suing to get a hold of money that they were due from the federal government before. And half of the proceeds from the federal government end up being frittered away on suing and winning against the governor who just did it for nothing, except he's happy because in the end, I've burned half of a school system's money. They pissed me off and I burned their checks. And even if I couldn't withhold it all, at least I reduced the amount that they got by 50%. That'll show them to oppose me, even though I was wrong and lost in court. So back to the article, Ducey announced just outright on Tuesday that he was going to do this. Parents, he says, are in the driver's seat and it's their right to make decisions that best fit the needs of their children. What does that have to do with federal funding? Nothing. Safety recommendations are welcomed and encouraged. Mandates that place more stress on students and families aren't. 
D.C. said in a statement. These grants acknowledge efforts by schools and educators that are following state laws and keeping their classroom doors open for Arizona students. Uh, but are they? They're federal grants. He's treating them as though they're state grants, which he can because we block granted them a hundred years ago. But no, these grants don't acknowledge efforts by schools and educators following state laws. These are federal grants and you shouldn't have your hands on this money and you got no role in any of this except an administrative role. We give it to you, you hand it out. That's all there is to it. You're not supposed to interfere in their distribution. But the story goes on. In order for school districts to qualify for the grants, which total about $163 million, they must reopen schools for in-person learning and adhere to, quote, all state laws, which includes the state ban on mask mandates in schools, according to CNN. We can read the CNN article to see for sure. Is it the case that the federal law authorizing the grant program requires uh, adherence to all state laws? Maybe. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your support. We literally could not do this without you. Welcome back now to the Cake Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Just watching a couple of other uh, developments as uh, they happen here. Let's see. Have I got this right? Well, first of all, I just checked in on Twitter, saw a story fly by. Uh, that I felt like commenting on and, uh, well, tapped in a response out to that one. But this one here uh, deals with <clears throat> issues that we actually have been talking about on today's show. Bill Scher, uh noting that uh, uh, Abigail Spanberger, occupying her middle-of-the-road position here, sounding quite sympathetic to the moderate group of nine, uh, not really moderate, group of nines, Demands to delink infrastructure bill, the standalone bill, from reconciliation. And uh, the poll quote that Bill sees here is, you don't have a combined birthday party and Christmas party because they're two different things. Okay, very interesting. Uh, to which uh, I, you know, I felt like I had to respond, and I don't know whether my I, now I'm trying to think through the response a little bit more, but I've tapped it out already and sent it out. But I was just thinking about that as a as an excuse. I should look at the article that he's talking about here and uh, be sure about that. But it, the idea, I get the, the sentiment, you don't have a combined birthday party and Christmas party because they're two different things. That's true as far as planning the party goes. I mean, it could be up to you. Like you might say, I don't want to have a combined birthday and Christmas party for my son, even though he was born on December 23rd, 24th, 26th, possibly the 25th, whatever. And, uh, you know, as a parent, you might choose not to combine the two parties because you don't want to make the kid feel like he's somehow getting less than he should be getting for these two separate things. Of course, it's possible that perhaps your family is Jewish and it's just fine. You can go ahead and have a combined Christmas party because it means nothing to you <laughs> but like, or if your neighbor is having a christmas party you can acknowledge your son's birthday there i don't know but then uh, who knows people can get upset about it. i get the idea you you want the kids to feel like their birthday is as special as anybody else your other children were born in february say uh then why do they always get a birthday party and i get a combined christmas and birthday i understand the sentiment but if you're not the host and you're not planning but another host has done this and said, we're going to have a Christmas party. Oh, there goes the phone again in the background. 
Uh, somehow my deprogramming of the phone has gone away during the two weeks that we were off, and uh, I'll have to work on that one. Anyway, <clears throat> if you are invited, say, to a Christmas party by your neighbor, and you say, well, I don't know, what if you said to your neighbor, well, geez, I don't know if we're going to come over there uh, because it's my son's birthday, and we were planning on having a birthday party for him, him uh, for him and his friends, or whatever, uh, the family, right over here. And if your friend, what do you do here? If your friend says, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you come on over and we'll get a birthday cake and we'll take a moment during the Christmas party to acknowledge your son's birthday and wish him a happy birthday. You know, or, or maybe not even proposing it as an alternative, but saying, hey, I got an idea, you know, come on over to our Christmas party and we're going to do this thing. Now, you've just had the discussion in your family with your son. And my guess is that Abigail Spanberger's compromise in this situation is to say, we'll have a birthday party for you here. Our friend and neighbor has also invited us over and they would like to acknowledge your birthday at their Christmas party. What's the big deal? Why don't we do it, right? Well, it's, they're two separate things. I understand that, but we've been invited to this thing. And the point is we don't want to offend our neighbors or get in a fight with them by skipping their annual Christmas party. It's a big deal to them. They pay attention to who comes. They pay attention who, to who doesn't come. You know, it makes a difference. And or like if you're Abigail Spanberger, let's say, and you're running for office and it makes sense, for instance, for you to go to these things so that you're out there mixing with your neighbors and contacting people or you're invited to, a, you know, a fundraiser or a function or whatever. Somebody has somebody's Christmas party, a big company that has a Christmas party in your district or something. So you go to these things. You don't boycott the party to make a point about that sort of thing, right? I mean, you, you, you can separate them in your own mind, but the point is, do you make yourself a pariah in the neighborhood in order to make the point that Christmas and my son's birthday are separate things? Do you make yourself a pariah and sink your own priorities in order to make the point that the infrastructure deal and reconciliation are to you separate issues, whereas to all your colleagues in the Democratic Caucus, they're very much connected. But do you make the point, even if you think you're right, stand on principle and say, I won't participate in either the things you support or the things I support in order to make this point? Well, you do not. You go to those parties. You go to those things. You, you uh, recognize that not everybody feels the same way about your son's birthday as they do about Christmas. And then you do your own thing on your own time. Anyway, I just thought that was a bad analogy. And it's not surprising that Abigail Spanberger made a bad analogy about something like this. Uh, I don't hate Abigail Spanberger, but she's not that impressive to me. That's all I can say. And uh, maybe it's because of things like this. I just think that it's a bad analogy. Now, my wife would say, you're in no position to accuse anybody of making bad analogies. Uh, however, uh, I will analogize that to something uh, wherein I am in a good position to do something like that. Uh, here's Armando's response, so just in case you were wondering. And because we don't have him on the show today. I don't know. We could. He, If he were here today, he would say, well, one, he would say, <coughs> excuse me. Then he would say, uh, oh, that, right, he'd be driving, of course, right? So a little skid there and almost get in an accident. But afterwards, he would say, you can agree on the details of both parties, or you can throw the reconciliation party first and then throw the BIB party. I mean, this particular point is dumb. If separation is the key, then the solution is simple. Pass the reconciliation bill and then pass the BIB, right? Okay, that's true. That's an excellent point too, right? Oh, well, they're separate. That's the issue. Okay, I'll separate them. Reconciliation first. Oh, well, I forgot to mention there's another point here. Actually, not only are they separate, but the BIB is the one I want passed. And I want passed first. Why? Um, reasons. I mean, there are real reasons. Like there's a you know massive amount of money to be distributed on something on which there's bipartisan agreement, and that's nice. And why wait? 
Let's get started today. I'm opposed to waiting for some artificial reason and not starting these infrastructure projects, which I assume they're saying uh, they're shovel ready. We could start work on them tomorrow, but instead we won't be able to start work on them until... Where are we? August, uh, so reconciliation. And a reconciliation bill is maybe, you know, it's possible that it wouldn't even, I mean, but most of it is ready to go. But it could be late in the year or it could be early next year. And you might waste six months of time that you could be working on uh, shovel-ready infrastructure projects. Although I have my doubts about that. At the end of the summer, is that the time you would really start something like that? I don't know. Entirely possible, but... Uh, anyway, basically, yeah, I mean, it kind of uh, exposes the the silliness of that point that, uh, well, it's all about separation. OK, fine. I separated. them. OK, well, it's actually about something else. And so my birthday party analogy falls apart completely. Hmm. Yeah. Well, OK. Good job there, Armando. All right. Diving back into other stories. Uh, let's see. There was the Greg Abbott one and he's being a jerk about that. Um, ah, here's something that we would have addressed directly during the break, but didn't, but that we can bring back to life thanks to the appearance of an, uh, an article by Ruth Marcus, who I usually don't depend on for anything, in the Washington Post uh, on the 13th. So the end of last week, she writes this piece again in the opinion section the most dangerous trump official you've never heard of needs to be heard from now you've heard of him because we've talked about him rather extensively in the last couple of weeks it's jeffrey clark uh the guy who tried to uh insinuate himself through trump flattery and conspiracy theory acceptance into the acting attorney general's job. Uh, here's how Ruth Marcus begins the thing with a quote from Donald Trump. People tell me Jeff Clark is great and I should put him in. People want me to replace DOJ leadership. President Donald Trump told the already acting attorney general Jeffrey Rosen on a December 27th, 2020 phone call suggesting with typical Trumpian subtlety that Rosen might soon find himself out of a job if he didn't comply with Trump's demands to tell people, tell people this was an illegal, corrupt election. You all remember just before the break that we learned, uh, because someone was writing a book about such things, that this was the deal in the offing, that uh, Trump would replace Rosen with Clark, with the assumption that Clark would then go out and announce with the power of the acting attorney general ship behind him that uh, everything was corrupt and you ought to believe it. After all, I'm the attorney general, right? Uh, okay, uh, but it didn't come to pass, but it could have and it was something they were trying and that's outrageous. The handwritten notes of the call taken by the Justice Department's acting number two official, Richard Donahue, and released recently by the House Oversight Committee, underscore the imperative of obtaining testimony from Clark about his efforts in league with Trump to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Here I'll pause and say the reason I bring this back up is, yeah, we should be hearing from him. Yeah, he should be a witness at the hearings and investigations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, possibly even a part of the January 6th uh, investigation. But uh, during the break, I happened to see Armando and I think some others make the point, uh, and it's a good one, that maybe we ought to be impeaching Jeff Clark. After all, he's still at the Department of Justice and still working there, I believe. Uh, but impeach him from whatever, I, whatever, he's a federal officer. He can be impeached. And even if he has left the Department of Justice, and I'm I'm not certain that he, ha I, I mean, I don't think he has, but now I'm starting to doubt what reporting did I read? I mean, I would have left if I were him. But even if he has left, as you know, you can still impeach people who have left federal office. And we might as well do that to really put the focus on him, really put him under the microscope and bar him from future federal service. He really just doesn't belong. He's lost his ability to work effectively in the Department of Justice because he's suffering from a Trump psychosis. I don't know how it happened to him. Uh, it says here, 
uh, in the next paragraph. No one who knew Jeffrey Bossert Clark, and by the way, he was reported to be particularly insistent on having all three names on department filings in his role as assistant attorney general, but no one who knew him took him for the kind of full-blown conspiracy-chasing Trumpist who emerged in the aftermath of the 2020 election. The documents show Clark, among other things, demanding a classified intelligence briefing from Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe, fat lot of good, that'll do anybody, about supposed evidence of a Dominion voting machine that accessed the internet through the smart thermostat in the room somehow, with a net connection trail leading back to China. I mean, I guess it's all theoretically possible, but it just sounds so dumb. On the other hand, no one took him for a potential attorney general of the United States either. But the point here that Ruth is attempting to make at first is uh, his colleagues didn't think he was a lunatic, but it turns out that he was. So impeach him. He's, he's Something snapped and the guy doesn't belong in the federal government now or ever again. So I think the, you know, to me, impeachment is a fine route for that. Really put the focus on him. Show exactly how bad this thing was because it'll never reach that. Like, even if he testifies to an investigative committee, it will never be made clear to people just how incredibly dangerous the game he was playing was. I think at least Ruth Marcus has some idea about that, according to the headline. Clark was an obscure attorney in private practice at a major law firm, Kirkland & Ellis, but a non-equity partner who was not entitled to share in the firm's profits. And then he was named to a relatively obscure position at the Justice Department, that it was Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division. Then, in the waning days of the administration, tasked to head the civil division as well, which is a big deal. A graduate of Harvard College and Georgetown Law School, supposedly a smart guy, right? Clark was a conservative, yes, a member of the Federalist Society, but not, to all appearances, a diehard Trump loyalist. Then came the election, and with it, Clark's remarkable new role as improbable presidential consigliere and energetic chaser after of crackpot rumors of election fraud. Perhaps Clark, scouring the wildest reaches of the Internet, became a true believer in the losing cause of election fraud. Perhaps he was tempted by Trump's dangling the attorney general's job before him. Ambition has a way of distorting judgment. Either way, he became, for a brief time, the most dangerous Trump administration official you've never heard of. Clark was connected with Trump through Representative Scott Perry, a Republican of Pennsylvania, a member of the House Freedom Caucus, opening a highly irregular backdoor channel for the president to go around more senior officials who were frustrating his efforts to use the Justice Department to contest the election results. Clark's lawyer did not respond to a request for comment. In January, when reports of his activities first surfaced, Clark said, that, quote, all my official communications were consistent with law, whatever that means. Clark's involvement emerged in the December 27th phone call between Rosen and Trump. The next day, he proposed sending an outlandish letter to Georgia state officials asserting, incorrectly, that Justice, the Justice Department, had, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, unquote, including Georgia, and urging a special legislative session. I think we should get it out as soon as possible, Clark urged Rosen and Donahue. Responded Donahue, there is no chance that I would sign this letter or anything remotely like this, and pretty much shut him down. On January 1st, the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, emailed Rosen about, quote, allegations of signature match anomalies in Fulton County, Georgia. Can you get Jeff Clark to engage on this issue immediately to determine if there is any truth to this allegation, Meadows asked. Rosen said to Donahue, can you believe this? I'm not going to respond. Uh, what, you know, why, wh why single out Clark and say, can you get Jeff Clark to engage on this issue? They knew, of course, that he would be willing to engage in this issue. But as head of the, I mean, even acting head of the civil division, it, Yes, I think that's where the case would fall, but not on December 27th on an outgoing administration. Anyway, but it didn't matter because Clark was off and running in pursuit of fraud. 
I spoke to the source, and I am on with the guy who took the video right now, Clark reported in a January 2nd email to Rosen under the subject line, Atlanta. All the while, Clark and Trump were discussing the plan to make him attorney general, foiled in part because Clark spilled the beans to Rosen, magnanimously offering him the chance to stay on as his number two, at which point Rosen secured an emergency Oval Office meeting Sunday, January 3rd, with Trump, Clark, and other officials, at which Trump was dissuaded from making the switch because of the mass resignations at justice he would told, was told would ensue. People, this is not normal. It is not proper. The head of the civil division, acting or not, doesn't jump on the phone to personally interview witnesses. He doesn't do and runs around his boss, no less participate in a scheme to topple him with the president. Most pertinent, lawyers at the Justice Department have a single client, the United States, not Donald Trump, not whoever's president, nothing like that, right? They represent the president in his role as president, not in his capacity as political candidate. The president has private counsel, lawyers paid by his campaign, not the taxpayers to do that job. The Justice Department has a legitimate role in reviewing claims of election fraud, but it doesn't exercise that authority at the express direction of an aggrieved candidate, even one who is the sitting president or that president's underling. All of which leads to the fundamental point to understand how close the country came to having the election results overturned, to know whether this activity was merely bone-chilling or rises to the level of a criminal offense, it is important to secure Clark's testimony, and it's not entirely clear that's going to happen. The Justice Department Inspector General is looking into the goings-on at the department, but may not be able to compel Clark's testimony. And the same is true of the Senate Judiciary Committee, before which Rosen and Donahue testified voluntarily. The House Oversight Committee, which has the documents, has ceded authority to the Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection, properly perhaps, which has other matters piled on its plate, which to me only means it's that much more imperative to simply impeach the man and say, look, we can't compel your testimony, but if you don't want to show up in your own defense, that's cool by us. We'll impeach your ass without your answering the complaint. The questions include, how did Clark connect with Perry, the congressman? Any other members of Congress? What conversations or meetings did Clark have with White House officials? When did he speak with the president and what was said? Did the president give him any instructions about whether to tell Rosen about the conversations? The Justice Department has waived any claims of executive privilege here, so Clark cannot refuse to answer on those grounds. What communications did he have on his private email? on his personal phone or through secure messaging systems. These should be subpoenaed, she adds. With whom did he discuss the allegations of election fraud? What Trump campaign lawyers or other representatives? How did he come to draft the letter to Georgia officials? Was this done on a government computer? That would be improper all by itself. I could go on, she says, and I'm sure she could, but you get the point. Someone with subpoena power needs to get Jeffrey Clark under oath, and the sooner the better. Again, I say, impeach the guy and do it that way. Uh, and if you think that it's too much to add to the plate of either the January 6th committee or the Senate Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, whatever, the House Judiciary Committee can draw up the articles of impeachment, the House can pass them, the trial can be held in the Senate, it was, again, once again, with a special committee if necessary, uh, it doesn't have to tie up floor time. It doesn't certainly for uh, for an assistant attorney general it doesn't have to be done on the floor of the house. It could absolutely be done in committee. It doesn't even have to be done and wouldn't be done in the judiciary committee. They would form a special committee for that purpose. And then you have a parallel January sixth, uh, you know. Uh, uh, investigation going on in the Senate, despite the fact that they haven't been able to get that done there uh, the way the House has. I mean, I, it's entirely possible that there's opposition, but probably not among the Democrats to impeaching this guy. Uh, but you would only need uh, the 50 votes, perhaps plus the tie-breaking vote, in order to form the special impeachment committee to conduct the investigation. Again, if, it, if the impeachment ends up, you know, if the, 
the trial ends up going nowhere or the verdict ends up being not guilty, that's still okay. You want to have that investigation, you want to have a special focus on him, and you don't want it to to uh, have it be just one of several issues being handled by January 6th investigators, then fine, go this direction instead. Just throwing it out there, it's not inconsistent with what Ruth Marcus has to say, and she may very well endorse the same thing. All right, let's see. Uh, Other things that uh, we might be able to squeeze in before the end of the show. Gosh, probably nothing, but uh, we could... To start out on something and then say, damn, if only we had more time to talk about it. It could be something like that. Uh, let's see. Hmm, we've covered most of that. Uh, I'm just sort of scrolling back to see what might otherwise uh, make a good story here that we that would be new. Hmm. Ah, well, here's a, a, a strange and unusual thing. I guess we didn't get to mention this one. We can keep it relatively short, I think. It's not a super important piece of news, but I thought we might as well throw it out there anyway just to get it on the record. And at the end of the show, when we don't have that much time, as good a time as any. Uh, I noted during the break the fact that it looked like Donald Trump's hand-picked Georgia Senate candidate, Herschel Walker, which was seemed like a kind of a silly pick to begin with, may also turn out to be a very bad idea with capital letters, V-B-I. Why is that? I For this purpose, I grab the Daily Coast um, uh, diary from Poop Dog Comedy. Everybody's pal, Poop Dog Comedy. Georgia Senate story here. Looks like Herschel Walker's wife committed election fraud in Georgia. Gee whiz, we ought to have an investigation of that. Uh, why is... Uh, 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 Jeffrey Clark not interested in, in figuring that one out. So there was some election fraud in Georgia, possibly. They just weren't looking into it because Republicans, once again, were the ones committing it. Uh, the story comes from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and the excerpt grabbed by our pal Poop Dog Comedy here reads, Potential Republican U.S. Senate candidate Herschel Walker and his wife live in Texas, but she voted in Georgia's election for president last fall. The absentee ballot cast by Julie Blanchard raises questions about whether she was allowed to vote in Georgia while living in Texas, which doesn't explain it by itself, but there's more. uh, Because, of course, if you are from Georgia, but you happen to be in Texas while the election is going on, then yeah, sure, you can vote in Georgia. But what about if you've been living there in Texas and saying that's your home? It's illegal for non-residents to vote in Georgia in most circumstances, The questionable vote could undercut one of Walker's main talking points, by the way, because, again, remember, he's Trump's hand-picked candidate there. So what's his main talking point going to be? Uh, Election fraud in Georgia that cost Donald Trump the election, because that's what all Georgians want to talk about in the Senate, to the exclusion of everything else. The questionable vote could undercut one of Walker's main talking points if he enters the race, which I think he has, against Democratic U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock. He was up for a full term in November of 2022. Walker has called for prosecutions of voter fraud, even though there's no evidence of rampant abuse. And he's promoted other false claims of voting irregularities by President, former President Donald Trump, who has encouraged him to enter the race. Uh, also, he, the poop dog comedy points out this tweet from Herschel Walker certainly hasn't aged well. Play by the rules. The American people demand only legal ballots be counted. Anyone manipulating, anyone manipulating this election should be prosecuted. Well, the report states that Blanchard hasn't voted in Georgia since 2008, and her other voter registration was canceled in Georgia in 2017. She renewed it in 2019 and still has a Georgia driver's license, even though she lives in Texas. Here's something else from the report. State law determines residency based on where a voter's habitation is fixed. And those who move to another state with the intention of making it their residence lose their eligibility to vote in Georgia. Blanchard and Walker purchased their Texas property in 2011. And in case you thought, oh, well, maybe it's just a second home there. They receive a homestead exemption on their property taxes, according to public records. Homestead exemptions are granted to homeowners for their legal residence. 
They're one primary legal residence, folks. Homestead exemptions are granted to homeowners for their legal residence. Blanchard didn't claim a homestead exemption on her Fulton County property in Georgia last year. She claimed it in Texas. That's the problem. But yeah, this was supposed to be the GOP's top guy to take on Raphael Warnick. Uh, another excerpt from the article is Herschel Walker continued to flirt with a race for U.S. Senate. A survey by left-leaning public policy polling shows why the Republican can bide his time. The poll shows roughly three-quarters of Republican voters giving him a favorable rating with just 7% unfavorability, putting the football icon in a better position than either of the two other Republicans tested in the poll. So, hey, it could work, right? But... Well, gee whiz. Meanwhile, as it turns out, uh, it looks like his wife might need to be prosecuted in Georgia, according to his own platform for running for the Senate. So I wonder whether he'll drop that provision of his platform or just simply do the Trumpy thing and say, everybody else besides my wife should be prosecuted. What I really mean is... Not if they're Republicans, but Democrats should certainly be done because Democrats, when they commit fraud, it's to elect the wrong guy. Whereas when Republicans commit fraud, it's to elect the right guy. So we want that, don't we? Hmm. Well, anyway, we'll see whether that or anything is capable of sinking the uh, candidacy. I don't know. Normally, I would say we'll see whether he's even capable of making a real candidacy out of it in the first place. But they bypass such things in the Trump era. Anyway, not the most important news, but I just thought it would be funny. For the most important news, stay tuned for Justice Putnam in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to K Grow in the Morning. So what have we been missing here? Well, of course, there's much news about Afghanistan and the comparisons to Vietnam. But on the rest of the menu, a federal lawsuit alleges Wisconsin authorities' conspiracies with white supremacists led to the Kyle Rittenhouse killings. That will be an interesting story to unravel. That and much more next, and we'll see you tomorrow.